Today we're going to talk about two little girls who went missing in 1975, but no answers would be provided until 40 years later. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings in the world, you've come to the right place. Be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss video upload. Let's get started. In 1975, John and Mary Lyon were living in Maryland with their four children. John Lyon was a well-known radio host, and he would later work as a victim's counselor. On March 25, 1975, John and Mary's two daughters, Catherine Lyon, who was 10, and Sheila Lyon, who was 12, the girls asked their mother if they could go to the Wheaton Plaza shopping mall, which was about a half a mile away from their home. And they wanted to go to the mall to see the Easter exhibits. They were on break from school, and everybody was celebrating, and they really wanted to go and just kind of walk around and look. The girls did plan on having lunch at a place called the Orange Bowl, which was a pizza restaurant in the mall. Their mother Mary was like, okay, but you need to be home by 4 p.m. Not after 4, but at 4 p.m. And the girls were super excited to be going on their own little adventure together. Their mother Mary figured because it was like Easter break, everybody was going to be out. They were going to be at the mall. There's going to be tons of people around. So the girls really would be safe. It's only a half a mile walk from the home. She really didn't worry too much about the girls going. So sometime between 11 and noon, the girls left, Mary watched them go, and she continued on with her day. When four o'clock rolled around, she started to get a little worried, but she realized the girls sometimes did come home late. Maybe they hadn't been watching the time. Maybe they were now walking back. So she really wasn't overly worried at that point. But as time is creeping by, the girl's mother, Mary, soon realizes that she is actually quite worried about the girls. And when 7 p.m. rolled around and the girls still weren't home, the police were called. And almost immediately from that point forward, an extensive search was underway. Police would be able to put together a timeline and they felt comfortable enough to release this to the public. So they said between 11 a.m. and noon, the girls left their home. And then around 1 p.m., a neighborhood child sees both of the girls outside of that restaurant, the Orange Bowl. And he says that while they're outside of that restaurant, they're speaking to a man, but he didn't know who that man was. And then at 2 p.m. that day, the girl's older brother does actually see them eating pizza out the restaurant. And then between 2.30 and 3 p.m., a friend does see the girls walking westward down a street near the mall, which was apparently one of the most direct routes to their home. So we can assume between 2.30 and 3, the girls were going to go home. They were walking towards their home. And this really is the final sighting of the girls that the police can confirm. Obviously, that 4 p.m. curfew rolls around and their mother's like, come on, like, where are you guys? You know, it's 4 p.m. And of course, as time goes on, that anger diminishes to them being maybe disrespectful and not, you know, coming home during curfew to sheer panic. Where are my daughters? They're not home yet. They were supposed to be home by four. Even if they were going to be a little late, you know, that's okay. But this is ours now and they're not here. And then by 7 p.m., the police are called. Apparently, at this time, the residents of a nursing home were also questioned, like, one by one. They questioned every single person in the nursing home to see if they could drum up any leads or if they had seen the girls walk by. Pretty much anything. Scuba divers were brought in to go through bodies of water, like ponds and things like that, and they didn't find anything. Police really dived into this case and were investigating every single lead that they could. They, I mean, they went to extensive lengths to try to find these two little girls, but they came up with nothing. And of course, a case like this is going to blow up. It's 1975. Everybody thinks that, you know, the world is a relatively safe place. Two little girls go to the mall. They have their pizza lunch. They look at the Easter exhibits. They're walking home and then they simply vanish. I mean, it's a complete nightmare for anybody. But of course, when you have this really safe suburban neighborhood, everybody's going to be in distress because they don't know who would do something like this and who you can trust. And now, obviously, they're going to look at their children and say, okay, well, we need to make sure you're not alone and you can't walk places alone and go outside by yourself. So obviously, this caused uproar. Not only were two little girls missing, but there was no trace of them. And of course, with a case like this that's so high profile, they are going to be going through so many leads and tips. And during this time, there was also people who would call the family and demand like money for a safe return of the two girls. On April 4th, 1975, the family would receive a phone call from an unidentified man who basically said, you need to leave $10,000 in a briefcase in a courthouse bathroom, and I will make sure your girls get home safely. They did what they were supposed to do. They left the money in this courtroom bathroom, but the money was never taken. I guess the caller would later call them again and say that the police were surrounding the bathroom and that he couldn't take it. And by this point, the Lyon family was like, if you have our daughters and you want us to pay you, you need to show us some sort of proof that you do have them. 
and the caller basically said that he would call them back and then never did. So again, it was probably a hoax. And then a witness in Virginia would come forward and say that on April 7th, 1975, this witness saw two girls bound and gagged in a station wagon and they resembled Sheila and Catherine. The witness would say that it was around 7.30 a.m. that morning when they saw the girls in that car. Apparently the driver of that station wagon matched a sketch of the unidentified man talking to the girls at the restaurant. Apparently when the man driving the station wagon realized that he was being tailed by the witness, he ran a red light and sped towards Route 234 towards Interstate 66 in Virginia. The witness would note that the station wagon did have Maryland license plates, but they were only able to identify a few of the letters because the license plate had been bent. And that tip was treated as credible, but eventually police were kind of questioning whether it was or not. The case would pretty much go cold for 40 years. They really had no idea what happened to these two little girls. So investigator after investigator would pick it up and pick it up and try to track down leads and all of that and close the case. They didn't make any progress. That is until 2013 when detectives would open the case again. So when a cold case is open, obviously that new investigator has to go through every single file and every witness statement, everything they have, they have to go through over again. As detectives are going through this cold case now, they come across a statement from a witness. So back in 1975, a man known as Lloyd Lee Welch gave a statement to authorities. At the time, Lloyd was only 18 years old and he gave a very detailed statement about witnessing the girl's abduction. Police believe he gave a false statement so that he could collect the reward money for the girls. So in the 70s, there were compository sketches made from witness accounts. And as they're going through this paperwork in 2013, they realize that Lloyd does actually match one of those sketches. So as investigators are coming to these realizations, they're like, this seems more than just coincidence. So they decide to track down his whereabouts. So when Detective Chris Homrock discovered this statement given by this 18 year old, he's looking at it and I'm sure he's like, why didn't they follow up on this? Like this is a very detailed account of what happened that day. It seemed very strange, so he wanted to track down Lloyd, and he would find Lloyd in prison. And Lloyd was in prison for molesting a minor. Red flags at this point are going off in his head. Apparently when they went to question Lloyd, he was serving 33 years in prison for molesting a 10 year old girl. And he was basically at the end of that term. But in 1975, Lloyd Welch was a very well-known kind of drifter and he had a drug and alcohol issue. So when he gave police that statement, I'm sure they definitely did not deem it as credible, but had they maybe just looked a little bit closer, I don't know. So on October 16th, 2013, Detective Dave Davis went with Detective Chris Homrock to interview Lloyd Welch. And when they got into the interview room with Lloyd, the first thing Lloyd said to them was, I know why you're here. And then he gave them this sly grin. And then he said, you're here about those two missing kids. The detectives would soon realize that Lloyd pretty much enjoyed talking. Like he wasn't one of those suspects where you had to interrogate. He just kind of wanted to talk for the sake of talking. So the detectives just kind of sat back and listened. During their first meeting, Lloyd would basically say, I had nothing to do with this. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't rape anybody. I didn't do nothing to those girls. I really don't have much to tell. And so they just kind of let him keep on talking. And after a full day of interrogation, Lloyd would really slip up. At that point in the investigation, the detectives were working on the idea that perhaps Lloyd had assisted another pedophile in abducting those girls and this pedophile's name was Ray Maliski. So as they're kind of wrapping up their session, this interrogation, Dave says to Lloyd, all right, I think we're pretty much done. Well, I wanted to ask your opinion only, what do you think Maliski did to those girls? Personally, Lloyd asked, yeah, I'm asking you for an opinion. Lloyd would say, well, my opinion is that he killed them and raped them. He killed them and he probably burned them. I don't know. And that moment, the detectives kind of realized Nobody had known anything about burning anybody. They didn't know what happened to the girls. But that seemed like a very particular thing. So of course, detectives would keep going back to question Lloyd. And eventually he would admit that he helped kidnap the girls, but this wasn't his plan. It was basically a plan that his family had come up with and carried out, and he had just helped make it happen. He would say that his father did sexually abuse him as a child, but he would also blame not only his father, his cousin, but his uncle for being the ones that did abduct these girls. Although detectives weren't sure what to believe, they did investigate Lloyd's family, and they would soon realize that he had two branches of family, one in Virginia 
and one in Maryland where the girls were abducted. So the ones in Virginia were of interest to the police because they did live on this like secluded hilltop in the mountains. And they really were very suspicious of newcomers, people not inside their family. They really didn't respect authority. And they said that they really had this knee-jerk reaction to violence. And they would soon learn something really disheartening. So apparently incest was very common inside this family. It was very much practiced. So they'd realized this family really was full of incest. And I guess it wasn't uncommon for the Welch children to experiment on each other with their siblings or their cousins. So as detectives are unearthing all of this, they're obviously incredibly disturbed, but they're realizing that maybe Lloyd isn't lying. Perhaps that his family did have a hand or forced him to help abduct these two little girls. I do want to stop here and say that viewer discretion is advised. The details are graphic and quite disturbing. At this point, Lloyd was claiming that his Uncle Dick was the person that did all of this. He said that he planned the girls' kidnapping and that he let people gang rape them and then he would eventually murder and dismember the girls. They would question Dick, who was about 70 at the time and he had a lot of health problems and apparently was on the out with a lot of his family. They said that he was very violent and aggressive and obviously were believing what they said, that the incest happened because of him. Uncle Dick would deny all of this. He was very upset about the accusations but police did note that he was very consistent with his statements. He was summoned to appear before a grand jury in February of 2015. The prosecutor would ask him if he had involvement in abducting these two little girls, and he would say, God is my witness, no. The prosecutor would say, did you transport one or both of these girls, Sheila or Kate Lyon, from Wheaton Plaza to your residence? He would say, no, I didn't. I've never been there. The prosecutor would say, did you have sexual contact with either Sheila or Kate Lyon? He would say, God is my witness, no. Do you have knowledge of any of these things that I've talked about. Dick would say, no, but I wish I did. And I guess earlier he had said that he wished he did have knowledge so that he could help police close the case. The prosecutor would ask, do you have any explanation why people would say that you did? Uncle Dick would say, I don't know why I'm getting accused. Them saying I did this, I done that, I haven't. So Dick's wife, Pat, was eventually charged with trying to organize the family to stonewall the investigation. Lloyd's cousin, Teddy Welch, who he did mention, as like one of the girl's kidnappers was only 11 at the time that the girls were kidnapped. He had run off with a middle-aged man to live together. But there were two other cousins, Henry Parker and his sister Connie Parker, and they basically became witnesses to what happened. They would say that during a fire, Uncle Dick brought out a duffel bag that was covered in blood and like dripping blood and threw it on the bonfire. But the thing is, each of these family members would tell stories about abuse and incest and all of that. And it wasn't just like one or two of the family members, it was a whole lot of the family members that did say that these things happened, incest happened, abuse happened. There was a lot of terrible things happening in this family at the time. Because they looked in on this family as a whole unit, they could kind of start to understand Lloyd back in 1975. So obviously he had left his family unit and had become sort of a drifter. And he kind of had like long, dirty hair and he was kind of a drug user. Um, and police didn't think that was really uncommon because during that time, a lot of men had been growing their hair out. But he was instilled from his core with a belief system from his family. And they very much obviously didn't respect the law enforcement and they were doing terrible things. So he was navigating the world with that belief system. And Lloyd himself would say that he was an angry young person at that time. And detectives would realize that Lloyd kept spinning stories. So he would say like one thing and then spin another story and another story. And detectives pretty much realized that he liked to tell stories and that they had to hone in and focus on certain details. So in May of 2015, one of the detectives would actually go to the place that Lloyd said the girls were obviously burnt. Um, and when he got there, he soon realized that it just didn't add up. Nothing about it made sense in the way that Lloyd told the story. When he did get to that place, he soon realized that the place that Lloyd said was a stone's throw away from the police headquarters, which meant police officers were coming and going at all times. And this was a very high profile case. So had police officers went by the spot and saw a bonfire happening, they may have been suspicious. So it just really didn't equate to Lloyd being truthful. So as they're kind of debunking everything, they're just realizing everything that Lloyd says, they have to check. And every time they check it, they're realizing it couldn't have happened this way for this reason or that reason. One of the detectives pretty much stumbled upon Lloyd's father's home. And it was the address that Lloyd had given when he made his first statement to the police back in 1975. And in that description, Lloyd said that he saw his uncle pull out of the driveway with the two little girls in his car and head towards the river. So basically at first the detective was at 
Lloyd's uncle's home and it didn't fit like what Lloyd had said. And when he got to Lloyd's father's home and he's kind of looking and reading the statement, he realizes that it makes sense if it was at Lloyd's father's home. So Dave would actually go and knock on this door and a woman opens and he tells her that he wants to look in the basement. And she basically showed him that there was no way to enter the basement through the home. She showed him that you had to go outside, down the porch, and along the driveway towards the backyard, and then steps would lead down to a padlocked door. And then the detective right away remembered that every single story that Lloyd told, there was a basement involved. And in these stories, he would say it was always a basement that you had to enter by walking around the home and down some stairs. You couldn't access it through the house. No matter where he placed this basement, whether it was his uncle's house or his cousin's, it was still the same description. So the detective would get the padlock off and he'd open it and it's just a bunch of furniture and stuff stacked there. But he got this feeling that that's where the two little girls had been. Like that's where they were held captive. And it, because it was detached from the home, people probably wouldn't know that they were there. So the detective would take a forensics team the next day to that place and they had to remove some of the furniture and things like that. Obviously began to look for blood, so they sprayed and they kept looking and using their lights. So the floors and the walls of the outer room didn't reveal anything, but when they cleared all the things from the back room and they began to spray, they said it lit up from floor to ceiling, meaning that there was a large amount of blood in that area. They said that it did look like a murder scene and that someone must have been slaughtered there. The detective piecing it together figured that Lloyd took them or lured them from the plaza or maybe picked them up as they were walking home. He probably drugged and raped them and kept them down there for an extended period of time before murdering and dismembering them. And the detective would soon realize that this was Lloyd's basement. It was a place where he partied and hung out and did drugs. It was like his space from the family home. It would make sense that Lloyd is the person who did ultimately murder these two little girls. They would eventually charge Lloyd with the murder of these two girls. And on September 12, 2017, he did plead guilty to two counts of felony murder, although he did continue to deny that he raped and killed these little girls. He was indicted in the Commonwealth because they felt that they had more evidence to get a conviction. And they assumed that he was more likely to accept a guilty plea in Virginia because they did have the death penalty. And he very much was scared to be put to death. He was sentenced to 48 years in prison, and by this time he was 60 years old. So a reporter would want to meet with Lloyd because there's a lot left over about this case that people have questions about. Lloyd basically told him, okay, put $5,000 in my account, and he laid out a bunch of other terms, and the reporter was like, well, I'm not going to do that, but we can discuss it in person. So the interviewer would ask him a series of questions, and the first one was, why did you keep talking to detectives? And basically Lloyd said that he had no choice. He said that he asked continually for a lawyer, but they ignored him. Um, of course, there's a lot of video footage that says otherwise, but that is what he stated. And then that detective, Dave Davis, had told the interviewer to convey a message to Lloyd. And that message was, Basically, your prison account will never be empty if you tell us where the girls' bodies are. And Lloyd would say, I've told them all I know. And he said, just because a person pleads guilty to something doesn't mean they're guilty of it. I did not murder or kidnap those girls. So of course the journalist is like, okay, well who did? And he's like, Uncle Dick. And Lloyd would go on to say, how do you think I would take two little girls out of the mall kicking and screaming? Who would be able to do something like that? A man with a uniform. And apparently at the time, Dick worked as a security guard. The reporter would note that during this time, Lloyd did seem a little bit prideful about the 40 years it took investigators to solve the case. He would even say, I'll bet it seemed like the perfect crime, didn't it? Basically, during the interview, he did complain that inmates treated him as a child rapist and murderer. And obviously, we all know that plenty of people in prison do not stand for child rapists or child murderers. And typically if a child rapist or child murderer is put in general population, they're going to have a hard time if not be murdered. He basically said that he enjoyed the interviews with the police because it got him out of prison for a little bit of time. Porter realized that, like, this isn't going to change. He's not going to tell me what happened. He's going to keep telling the same stories over and over again, and he's not going to admit to what he did or where the girls are. So he left the interview after an hour and he wrote a letter to Lloyd in prison and he just let him know that he wasn't going to accept his terms of like the $5,000 and whatever else. And that was it. So Lloyd would write a letter to this interviewer and say, I received your letter and I'm very disappointed in this. So let me say this to you so you can understand what I'm saying to you. First, the documentary you are doing, you may not use any pictures of me or Helen and you may not use my name in it any way at all. Now, as for your book, I do not give you any permission to use my or any pictures 
pictures of me or Helen in any way. You do not have my approval or authorization to use anything about the Welsh's name. You may not use any of the interview sessions that you have of me. Sorry we did not come to some kind of understanding. If you wanted to come to see me, then you'll have to put $300 on my commissionary's books before you can talk to me again. My time is money now. So I do want to say, although it was human blood in that basement, the samples were too degraded to make a match to anybody. Lloyd's attorney would state that Lloyd had limited intellectual abilities and basically was taken advantage of by older adults, meaning the adults in his family, and was forced to help abduct these two little girls. So the little girls' bodies have never been recovered. And a lot of people do have problems with this case because theoretically Lloyd could have done it, but there's no evidence except the blood that can't be matched. They do have the statement that Lloyd gave in specific and a lot of detail that does match the crime. Um, so theoretically, did somebody in Lloyd's family commit this crime? Possibly. Did Lloyd commit it? More than likely. I don't know. I would like to know what you guys think about this case. Although it took 40 years to solve, I question why it wasn't solved sooner. I mean, Lloyd made this statement if they had checked Lloyd's house where he was living and the address that was on the statement is where they found that basement. Could they have found the girls? Would they have been able to match the DNA? Would he have been convicted of murder much sooner? I don't know. There's a lot to this case and a lot of people don't know if, you know, just Lloyd is responsible. And given the details of the family abuse and things like that, it very well could be that other people were responsible and he helped and had a role in it. So let me know what you think in the comments. I'm really interested and invested in this case, so I'd like to know what you guys think. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. If you have a suggestion for a case, pop it in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. And I'll see you next time.